I want to share with you this morning about a study they did at Princeton Seminary. And uh, I've, I've mentioned this in some circles before, and you may actually be familiar with this study, but at Princeton Seminary, they took a group of seminary students and they gave 50, half of them two different tasks. And their task was to go across campus and make a presentation. And the first group was told they were going to have to travel across campus to another building, and they were going to make a presentation to freshman seminary students on job opportunities after graduation. The other group was told, we want you to go and present a message on the Good Samaritan in the other building to the freshman students. And so they set up this study, and they had these two groups of students going to give this presentation. And they also were studying uh, how, what difference that would make if they planted somebody along the way who was in distress. And so on the travel from one building to the other, there was a plant. The researchers planted a person who was leaning against a wall and obviously in pain. And what they were seeing was who would stop and ask if the person was all okay. That's all the student had to do was stop and say, is everything okay? Are you doing okay? That's all they had to do was ask the question. They didn't have to do anything, just had to respond to the need. There's another little twist the researchers threw into this study. And just before the students left the one building to go give their presentation, they were told one of three things. Some were told, you're going to be late if you don't get there right away. Some were told, you have just enough time to make it to the other building. And some were told, you actually have extra time and you have some time, you, you know, you've got a few extra minutes to get there. It had nothing to do with whether or not they were presenting on the Good Samaritan. It had nothing to do with the subject matter of their presentation. It had everything to do with what they were told before they left the room. Whether they had time or didn't have time. They found that more students, res the, 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 more students responded when they were told they had enough time to get to the other building. The one thing that was preventing them from stopping and meeting the need of the person was time and their understanding of if they had enough time. I, I don't know about you, but I can relate to that. You know what I'm saying? You know, we see the needs around us, and one of the first things we think is, I just don't have enough time. I've got all these other things going on. I don't have the time to meet that need. And so that's why we also relate to this story of the Good Samaritan. We all want to be the Good Samaritan. We all like the Good Samaritan. But we also identify with the priest and the temple assistant, do we not? We understand what it is to walk by when we see a need. I want to pull up a chart, take a look at this chart this morning. This is the chart. This is what the lawyer rightly says to Jesus. The lawyer who knew all the law, all the commandments, distilled the law and the commandments down to these two commandments. Love God, love your neighbor. That's what Jesus also said. That the greatest commandment is to love God and love your neighbor. And so this puts us on this XY axis. This is a chart. And it actually divides it up into what I would call four quadrants of believing and behaving and loving. And I think that we all find ourselves at different places on this chart. I know people who are really loving God and in our church every week, and they're really strong Christian people, but there's not much love for their neighbors or not much connection to their neighbors. Then I know people who are also really loving to their neighbors and care about people and reach out to people but there's not much of a relationship with God. And then there are obviously people in the world who don't love God and don't love their neighbor. And then there are people that uh, love their neighbor and love God. So here's my question this morning. Two que actually, two questions. And, I, want you, and you don't, I don't want you to answer out loud. This is just for you. In your daily life, which quadrant do you find you, that you most live in? Which quadrant do you on a daily, regular basis find yourself living in? So think about that. That's the first question. The second question is, which quadrant do you want to be in on a daily basis? Where do you want to live on a daily basis? Don't give an answer. We're going to come back to this in a little bit, in a few minutes. But I want us to be wrestling with that. I want us to be thinking about that. Where do we typically live and where do we want to be? So looking at that, 
they've discovered uh, the same uh, researcher who worked on the research at Princeton Seminary was a guy named Daniel Batson, and he's a social psychologist. And as a social psychologist, he's come up with a theory or a hypothesis, which is called, a big fancy word, it's called empathy altruism hypothesis. You all came this morning just to learn about that, I know. But he talked about that, and what he's hypothesized, and I think that he's gone to something here, he has said that every single one of us has the capacity to help others. In fact, we're all wired to meet the needs of somebody else. We're all wired to, when we, to, to give and to meet a need when we see it. We, we all would stop. We all would be the Good Samaritan. We actually are wired to do that. The question he began to ask is, so we're all wired to do that. We all have the capacity for empathy. What's stopping us from doing that? What's keeping us from empathizing with the needs of others? Because he understood that it actually when we feel empathy, we actually respond. If we don't feel empathy, we won't respond typically. And there, often he said there's a phrase that we often use, and you've probably used this phrase if you haven't heard this phrase. It's, well, put yourself in their shoes. Have you ever heard that before? Well, if you just put yourself in their shoes. He discovered that actually that's not enough to feel empathy. What we do when we put ourselves in someone else's shoes, we're actually just identifying with their distress and we're feeling our own personal distress. An example of that would be, uh, I remember watching Joe Theismann break his leg on, in football. You remember that? Some of you remember that? Or there was a Monday night game not too long ago when McCullough uh, broke his leg. Or, or maybe you've seen some other sporting event where someone gets injured and what do you do when you see that happen? You know, they show it like for the 25th time, you know, you've seen it. What do you, yeah, it, it, it's same right. Everybody cringe, you know, you're like this, you know. We're not feeling empathy there. We're feeling personal distress because we're identifying with the pain or whatever that person is. So we've put ourselves in their shoes, literally. But what are we feeling? We're not feeling empathy. We're actually feeling personal distress. We're not empathizing at all. We're just saying, I don't want to be that person. That's what's going on inside of us. And that's, that focus is who, who, who we focused on at that moment. You know, I, don't, I didn't want to run on down onto the field. I didn't want to get in my car and drive down to, to RFK Stadium. Remember RFK Stadium? By well, RFK Stadium and help Joe Theismann on the field. I was too busy cringing in my, so, you know, my sofa, my lazy boy, you know. Like, oh, that was terrible. See, the point is, if we don't feel empathy, what the, what the hypothesis is, if you and I don't feel some empathy, we're less likely to meet the need. We're less likely to respond to whatever the need is if we don't feel empathy. We feel personal distress, but do we feel empathy? Now, I'll ask this question. Who in the parable this morning was most likely to empathize with the man on the side of the road? Who in the story of the priest the temple assistant, and the Samaritan, which of those three were more likely to feel empathy if you think about who the Samaritan was versus the temple priest or the, or the assistant? It was the Samaritan, wasn't it? Because Samaritans were, and the gospel said it, despised. They knew what it was like to be trampled on. They knew what it was like to be put down. They knew what it was like to be a second-class citizen. So they knew, they felt, he, the Samaritan felt that and knew what it was like to feel that. So the good Samaritan was actually more likely to connect and feel empathy for the person on the side of the road because that was the Samaritan's experience. I, I want to just make a note here. Every negative experience that you and I have had may be helping to make us more empathetic to somebody else that maybe God uses those bad experiences in our lives to give us empathy for somebody else. Keep that in mind if you're going through a bad experience. Maybe that's God trying to help us to understand empathy. But just that's a side note. So if it's a Samaritan who feels empathy, and that's the key, the feeling of empathy, what keeps getting in the way of us feeling empathy? What keeps getting in the way of our lives for feeling empathy? Well, I think we actually learn from the priest and the temple assistant this morning. The priest. 
What was going on in the priest's mind as he passed by? You see, he's on the way from Jericho to Jerusalem. What's he going to be doing in Jerusalem? Anybody want to take a guess? He's going to be going to the temple. He's getting ready to do his priestly duties at the temple. And so he knew, rightly so, that if he were to touch a dead body or to help this man who who he didn't know anything about, or he would have defiled himself, he would have made himself unclean. And so he's on his way to the temple, and so he's worried about keeping himself pure because he knows he has to go serve in the temple. And so what is he concerned about? He's concerned about not getting the approval or the worthy or feeling worthy of God or not feeling worthy of You know, he's going to have to go to Jerusalem and he's going to have to encounter his colleagues and he's going to have to share with his colleagues, hey, you know, I've defiled myself. And so he's worried about the approval of somebody else. And it's interesting because I think that's one of the reasons that we don't always stop and feel empathy. What we rather, what we often feel is fear. Fear of something happening to us. Fear of not getting someone else's approval. Fear of, fear of feeling stupid or rejected or overwhelmed. I mean, what's the, when we see somebody on the side of the road and they're broken down, what's the first thing that pops in your mind? But stop, don't, they're going to be a serial killer. What's, what's at work there? Empathy? No. Fear. Right? <laughs> I I don't have the time to stop. I'm afraid I don't have enough time. What's at work there? Fear, not empathy. I'm not empathizing with the situation. So we, we think about how those things work. So fear, when we're feeling fear, we're not feeling empathy. So that's what's going on with the priest. The thing that we learn about the temple assistant is that the temple assistant was the person who actually was to go ahead and to prepare the temple for the priest. The temple assistant was the one that was responsible for getting all the things done and making sure everything was ready in the temple for the worship and the sacrifices in the temple. Notice where the temple priest is in the order down the road to Jericho. Who's late to the temple? That's just speculation on my part. The priest is ahead of the temple assistant. The temple assistant should have been ahead of the priest. He's late. Remember the Princeton study? (laughs) He's running out of time. He's got all these tasks to do when he gets to Jerusalem. He's got things to do. So he stops and he thinks, you know, I really should stop and I really should meet the needs of this person. But, you know, I got all these other things I got to do. Have you ever felt that way? I've got all these other tasks I've got to accomplish. I've got this schedule to fill. I've got these kids to get to here. I've got this place to be. Right? You know, there are two kinds of people in the world, right? Task people and cohesive people. You know what a task person is? let's take a very simple task like crossing the street okay you're on one side of the street the light changes your task is to cross the street you've got a group of people with you the task oriented person will stand on the corner and start going across the street and look back are you guys coming or what let's go and their task is to get across the street whether or not you come with them really doesn't matter to them they could care less if you make it across the street you might even get hit by a car but they're going you know, we're getting across the street, that's the task. I'm exaggerating. <laughs> then there are the cohesive people. And the cohesive people are standing on the corner and they say to the whole group of people, everybody hold hands now. <laughs> everybody got somebody's hand. Oh, the light's changing, everybody's got somebody's hand. And they're like slowly going across the street, making sure everybody's together. And they're singing, Kumbaya, my Lord, <laughs> Kumbaya. And so they're getting across the street, and then the, the light's changing. They're still, they haven't even got across the street yet because they're still trying to be together. And again, I've exaggerated the point, haven't I? But you and I are either task-oriented or cohesive. We're one of those two. The temple assistant, I think, was task-oriented because that's what I am. I actually asked my wife one time, I said, am I a task person or a cohesive person? Don't ever ask your spouse something like that. <laughs> She says to me, you're a task person disguised as a cohesive person. (laughs) And I thought, ooh. (laughs) You know, I want to be the cohesive person, but really I'm the task person, you know. I'm like, let's go, let's get to the temple, you know. We got to get things done. 
but I'm a pastor, so I have to pretend to be cohesive sometimes, you know? <laughs> Come on, at least sing, I'll, I'll get across the street, but we'll sing Kumbaya on the way, okay? We'll just do that. But that's part of it, is, is our task mentality. And, and I'm going to uh, just make an, a gross general assumption that we here in Howard County are probably more tasked than cohesive. I'm just going to guess at that. That's why I like everybody here so much. <laughs> but if you're really honest, you know, it's that task. And so, so we're so consumed with our tasks and our to-dos and our calendars and getting things done that we can miss the people on the side of the road. We can miss the needs around us. That can happen because we're so focused on the task. Like the temple assistant. And you know what we've done? We've even tried to make helping others fit our schedules. Have you noticed that? You know, I found one thing I've found about meeting needs of people, I can never predict when the need's going to come. So there is no way to schedule somebody else's need or crisis. Have you ever noticed that? But we still try and do that. We still try and do that. I mean, we've even got to the point where now people, you know, nonprofits market towards us to try and get our attention within our schedules. If you don't believe me, think about going to the store. You're in the store line. You're buying something at the store. You're about to spend $100 at Staples or grocery store or probably not at 7-Eleven. If you do, I don't know what you're spending $100 at 7-Eleven, but just $10 at 7-Eleven. But you're at 7-Eleven, and the cashier says to you, would you like to donate a dollar to da-da-da-da-da charity? Now, what's happening at that moment? I am responding based on some other things. And I, t- to be honest with you, if I'm confessing, I'm not feeling empathy at this moment. I'm feeling guilt. Because, you know, I'm spending $100. I can't spend another dollar to help somebody else. Am I feeling empathy at this point? No, I'm, it's about me at this point. And so then the other thought that's going through my head is, what is this cashier going to think of me if I don't give a dollar? Are you with me? Can I, can I get anybody here? Can I get a witness here? Does anybody else think this? Thank you, Paul. Good. That's right. I'm the only one with it this morning. That's right. Paul's always with me. Yeah. Right. And he's always got a joke for me, right? Yeah, right. All right. So we're with, so he, so we're there, and you're in the line, and the cash register, you know, so now you're feeling guilty. Now you're thinking, what does this other person think of me, right? Fear of approval, not being approved. And then what do they get to do? What do you get to do if you donate a dollar? You get to write your name on something, and they hang it in the store window, right? Now who's that about? Am I feeling empathy at all in any part of this situation, this transaction? No. It's all about me. It's all about me. And this is what some preachers have called sanctified consumerism. We're sanctifying our consumerism. We're, we're taking the edge off of why, you know, the guilt of spending so much money. Sometimes that's what we're doing. Uh, Goldman, I think it's Goldman... Uh, who wrote the book on uh, emotional intelligence, calls it a narcissistic hit. We're getting another narcissistic hit for our egos or for our feelings, uh, feeling that because we, we want to be a good person and we want to be seen as a good person. But that's not what leads to true help of somebody else. It's about empathy and feeling empathy for another person that responds to the true need. And that's what the Samaritan did Do you notice that the Samaritan velcroed himself to the person in need? Did you notice that he took care of this person in need, put him on his own donkey, got him to the inn, actually spent the night with the person throughout the night in the inn, making sure he was okay, then making sure that he had enough money to stay there and to recover after mending his wounds. He stayed connected and in connection till the need was fully met. That's a hard thing to do, but that's part of being Velcroed to somebody in need, to being Velcroed to making an impact in somebody else's life. So can we go back to that diagram again? I don't know which quadrant you want to be in this morning, but I know which one I want to be in. 
I know which one I want to live in. And that's the one where I'm loving God and I'm loving my neighbor. And here's the thing. One is not mutually exclusive of the other. It's a connection of both. It's not just love God. It's not just love your neighbor. Both those things actually go together. You see, when I am in relationship with God vertically, my vertical relationship with God, I actually get some of my own needs met of my need for love, my need for significance, my need to feel important, my need to be successful, my need to have other people's approval. If I'm approved by God, and if I am loved by God, I am no longer dictated and controlled by fear in reaching out to others. Does that make sense? I mean, God loves me and thinks I'm pretty awesome. I know you don't think that, but God does. But here's the other thing. God thinks you're awesome, and God loves you. Each of us are loved, and God thinks we're awesome. So who cares what other people think if God loves us that much? Why do we need the approval of somebody else in our life? And isn't our busyness about somebody else's approval? Isn't our crazy, hurried life about winning somebody's approval? Isn't it really about winning Take a look at this video clip that just came on the news recently about a teenager in Minnesota. Guy stops in the middle of a race, front of the pack, and stops to help somebody else and basically loses the race so that he could help somebody in need. Why didn't the other runners stop? I've actually seen this in other races that I've participated. Why didn't the other runners stop? Maybe they didn't see him. Maybe they were so focused on winning they didn't see him. That's the point. That sometimes we're so focused on winning in this life that we miss the people in need around us. I mean, isn't that what we're struggling for, striving for, busy for, hurried for? It's to win somebody's approval, to win, to cross that finish line, to win that bumper sticker on my minivan that says, I've got an honor roll student, to win that next sporting event at my kids, to win... Uh, the approval or to win that bonus at work or to get somebody's praise or honor my boss to win it's all about winning and when i'm so focused on winning i'm passing people by on the side of the road i'm passing people by in my life that are genuinely in need because i'm so focused on winning that i forget to empathize with those on the side of the road amen